going to start out first with the traps. The type I like to use for fox and some coyote, you know, areas that have fox and coyote in them, is a 175 Vectors. I prefer the offset jaws like this. And for chain length, I like to have the shorter chain as possible. The, chain, the, the traps, when they come new, have three lengths of chain in them. I'll cut the middle link out, I'll put a mid-chain swivel there, and then in the end chain swivel that comes on the factory trap, I'll add a long lap link for cross staking. That way I've got plenty of room in there to drive two stakes if need be. Don't have to Mickey Mouse around to get another, pull the trap up and go get another device or this and that to cross stake with. All my traps are rigged up the same. When we go for the modification and adjustment here, I like to, for my pans to fall free, but minimum side play. What I do is I'll close the dog eye a little bit with a pair of pliers or a pair of a pair of pliers like this. Just close that dog eye. And then I'll bend the trap dog up. And how I do that is bend it down. I'll put pliers on here and actually bend that down. What I'm doing here is I'm incre increasing the amount of pressure that's applied by the dog into the notch. A good mink trapper will bend the trap dog down so the trap will snap easier. If you bend that trap dog up, you have a lot more pressure up in the notch, and it'll be a lot better off because you'll, your pan tension will stay constant. It won't be changing. You use the pan set screw in here, that tension is going to change with rust, corrosion, over two or three days, some wet weather. You use this type of a rig here where you're bending your trap dog up. You're using that amount of tension that's placed by that trap dog on the notch from the amount of tension that actually the springs are placing on that strong jaw. I know it sounds complicated, but all it takes is just bending that trap dog up, get that up in the notch, and you're going to end up in real good shape. Offset jaws, I touched on them a little bit, just a little bit ago, but they're real important to have. I don't set a trap on dry land without offset jaws. They give me two advantages. First advantage is they let the levers ride higher so they can lock up. This trap snapped in this position is as strong as it gets. As these levers start to go down farther and farther, the trap gets weaker. With the gap in the jaws, once you have an animal's paw in here, the levers are going to automatically ride higher because of the gap, enabling the trap to be stronger. Also, there's going to be some blood circulation or flow to that pad, and that animal's not going to struggle near as much in the trap. Offset jaws are a real key and a super advantage to anybody running line on dry land. I'd like to go to the number three trap now. This is already set. It's a Victor number three coil spring. It's a round jaw model. I prefer the round jaw over the square because they're faster. It's just a known fact of physics that the circle, the round part of the jaws can close faster than the square because of the amount of distance that they have to cover. You'll notice as I put this trap in this position that you can see that bent up, that bent up dog you can see where about the, the position that that dog actually goes up into that trigger or up into that notch. You can see there's not a lot of travel left there for that trap to snap. Really effective. This is the best way to set them up. My coyote traps are set up the same way as my fox. Everything is the same. You want to be just like a Xerox machine, you know, and it just everything should be the same. That way when you reach in the truck and pull out something, it's always the same. You don't have to be messing with it or changing. I'm going to snap this trap off just to show you the amount of travel. Watch real close how much pan travel they go. Not hardly any pan travel, and it was just a nice, firm, crisp snap. Just a probably about pound and a half, two pounds of pan tension on there. That's just about right from anything that I'm trying to do with the, with the predators. I don't want a lot of pan tension. I don't want to miss a gray fox if he works over that set when I'm working for coyotes. Notice the pan's loose on the, on the threes, too. I let it, like it to fall free, minimum side play. Same length of chain on the threes. Now, treatment of your traps, I prefer four pounds of brown powder dye and four pounds of black mixed together in a 55-gallon drum for dyeing your traps. I found that the brown dye wears off fast, but is cheaper. The black dye lasts longer, but is more expensive. So a combination of the two gets you about the best dye job you can get for the money. I like pure odorless trap wax. I use it in a five gallon bucket. Be careful because wax is highly flammable and dangerous, but you can dip like six of these traps in a five gallon bucket at once. Count to a hundred, fish them out, lay them out on a piece of cardboard. I can get a piece of cardboard from an appliance store, let them dry, pack them traps tight in fiber drums. 
Don't put them in metal drums. They'll, you'll open it up for trapping season and they'll be rusted out. Use fiber drums or clean cardboard boxes to pack your traps away till season. You might think about sticking your trap chain in between the jaws on your traps. That'll coat the inside jaw surfaces too, which is pretty important. Let's talk a little bit about stakes and grapples now. Holding devices for your predators. Grapples are widely used in the Northwoods country, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, Maine, places where you want that trap along or near the roads, but you want that catch to be drug out of sight. I like about five feet of chain on my grapples. This is a two-pronged wolf drag. It's nice. It's not real heavy, so I know a fox can get it up out of the bed and get it head too, just like a coyote could, could on a heavier type drag. Just an S-hook hooking it onto the chain and another S-hook hooking it onto the trap. You could use a dog snap if you wanted, some type of quick connect clamp to hook it on your trap or take it off. That might make your rig a little more handier. They use a lot of these down in Arizona in the southwest too where you're trapping bobcats in areas where it's so rocky you can't stake or it's just so sandy you'd need a 50 inch stake to, to really get your set in well. As for trap stakes, I prefer the 24 inch smooth rod type. This is 7 16 smooth rod, has a pressed nail head and a washer on it. I prefer the smooth rod for a couple of reasons. The main one is the fact that you can get them out of frozen ground. You can drive this in and the end of October and in December you can pull it out of the ground where a rebar stake, if it's frozen in the ground, you're going to have a hard time getting it out. Also, it doesn't have the rebar ribs. Rebar stakes have those ribs on them. If you catch a coyote and he gets, gets to pulling on there just right, he'll start to jack that stake up and your swivel will slide down, catch on a rebar rib. Pretty soon he'll jack your stake right out of the ground. Smooth rod, you don't have that problem. This also has a little flanged end on it so your washers don't fall off. Kind of handy. You don't want to be looking for washers all day when you're out trapping. That washer is not welded on here or anything like that, so you got a lot of swivel action around the top of the stake, which I feel is, is key to keeping that trap from getting a twisted up chain and losing that animal. Especially in a 48-hour check like we're working in the, in the Dakotas here. These people that trap back east in Ohio, Pennsylvania, your 24-hour trap check law areas, then you can get by with a little less swivels and a little less swivel action around the stake because you're going to be there the next day. But nevertheless, think about setting it up to the optimum conditions like this and you'll have a lot better success on your line. Get right into the equipment now and just touch on some of the stuff I use. Standard 22 inch Yoho trowel. It's got the wide blade for digging your trap beds with. Heavy hammer for driving stakes. This is a four pound sledge. It's got a fiberglass handle and it's also got kind of a chopping blade on the end, a sod buster blade. You can really get in and work some heavy country with it. You're not monkeying around with the trowel. You can actually beat into some serious hard rock or ground and get your set in fast. I like the tall sided metal sifters. Uh, you can get a lot more dirt in them than the bread pan type. But the only drawback to them is the bottom falls out. They're spot welded in there. The bottom comes out. Most guys throw it away. Just go to the hardware store and buy some hardware cloth. This has just been fixed. Push it right in here. Your sifter's fixed. The sifter will last a long time. Pan covers. I prefer to have pan covers over pan pads because I feel as soon as you stick something underneath your pan of your trap, you've already got two strikes against you. Whether it's soft, it may get hard later, whatever. If you're using pan covers, nothing's under that pan, and you know you're safe from the, right from the jump. These um, fiberglass screen type pan covers are real beneficial. They work real well. They're cut to fit just inside the jaws of the trap. Uh, they're also kind of a coarse surface on them so the wind won't blow the, the dirt off the top of your trap. I keep a couple different kinds in here, not to mention sizes for either the 3s or 175s I'm using. I'm also using a lot of hamburger patty papers. Uh, they're real handy for pan covers because they're cheap and if the soil's moist they really work effective. Notice I got them in an old tin can. This is a coffee can beat up a lot of miles on this coffee can. There's not even a lid on it, but that's all right. You can just reach in and grab what I need. Kneeling pad's another item that's pretty handy. You should put an X on it or some type of marking so you always lay one side down so you're always kneeling on the opposite side. So if there's any human odors, it's on one side only. Uh, 
The main reason I use a kneeling pad is not for the human odors, but to keep my knees from getting real dirty or muddy. Also to keep any cactus or briar, stickers, um, sand burrs from getting stuck in your knees. You're doing a lot of bending. If you're running a long line, you're covering a lot of sets. Pretty handy. They don't take up much room. They're made out of the same material flotation vests are made of, Coast Guard approved type. Real handy. I carry all my equipment in a Leggett's Trapper's bag like this. I like it over a, a lot better over a bucket because it just falls open like this. Everything is right there, easily accessible to reach in and grab. Last part of my equipment here would be the dry dirt bucket. And inside the dry dirt bucket, besides carrying dry dirt, I carry my little lure pail. It's just a little metal paint pail you can buy at a paint shop or whatever. And my lures are all inside there, four ounce bottles and pints for bait. Usually I'll mark the top with magic marker so I can look in and grab the bait that I need. There's also a few old bones in here. I use those a lot for attractors near my sets, not necessarily at the set, we'll talk about that in a minute, but around my sets and the set areas, and it's kind of nice to have a few with you instead of having to look for them out in the field. I want to go in there, make that set, and be out of there. Dry dirt I collect in the fall and um, plowed fields, or you can get it under bridges or places like that during season. Dry dirt's pretty important to have with you. Rainy conditions or frozen ground conditions, you can still be making sets. I put all the one stuff that I store, the dry dirt, in these feed sacks back here. I have them in my barn at home. I can go in there and pull a feed sack out and I just carry it in the truck like this and dump the dirt out of the feed sack as needed. Last thing I'd like to talk about equipment wise is to, to tell you the fact that I carry two separate sets of equipment. I carry a set of equipment just like this for making fresh sets. In fact, this is my set equipment. And then I have another set for remakes after a catch. They're exactly the same, only the bags are marked so I know which is which. But I found that doing this keeps me organized and thinking about clean sets and equipment. You have to think a minute. If you've been trapping for a week, you've went to all the work of lying, dying, waxing your traps, getting all cleaned up, and you start out opening day and you're catching fox, you're catching coyotes, the first week you're doing great, you think you've got everything right, and then the next week you start ending up getting some scratchers and diggers and you start saying, oh no, what am I doing wrong? I'm, I'm making mistakes. A lot of times you might think about your equipment contaminating your set. If you're using traps out of the same box you were catching fox a week before, it's probably not your traps that are contaminated. You're probably contaminating your traps with dirty gloves, with um, sturdy sifters and trowels that smell like the animals you've caught the week before. So if you use two sets of equipment, if I go in on a skunk catch or I go in on a fox catch, I'm using a totally different set of equipment. So that equipment and gloves is going to smell like the fox or skunk catch. Then when I go to make a new set on a different farm or ranch, I grab my set equipment and those sets always smell like opening day. <laughs>